Okay, great. Uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Gokul and uh, this talk is going to be about the anatomy of deep learning frameworks or I like to call it as everything you wanted to know about deep learning frameworks but we're afraid to ask. So before we start, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm currently a master's student in computer science at ETH Zurich and I did my bachelor's from Vitspilani and uh, I'm a contributor to Tiano now and then because uh, grad, grad life takes it toll so there's that and uh, I'm working on right now my area of research is more on using deep learning for astronomy and for and GANs so you can find my work at uh, the website called space.ml and uh, this talk is basically an extension and more in-depth discussion of the topics I discussed in the blog article called the anatomy of deep learning frameworks and uh, I've posted a link to the slides on the on the events Facebook events page so you can check that out so you can follow it easily wait so now uh, what's this talk going to be about uh, it's basically going to be about understanding the internals of deep learning frameworks and and we're going to see that even though you have so many deep learning frameworks, they all have some common concepts that that are applicable towards all. And once you understand them, it's, it makes it easier for you to transition from one framework to another. And uh, it helps you get up to speed much faster there as well. And you will realize that like many things in deep learning, these concepts are not something new they have been around since 80s or even earlier and uh, some of them are, are taken from compilers so we'll see that as well and uh, finally and i think this is the most interesting part and in how you could write your own deep learning frameworks because by the end of this talk you will know that it's uh, not a big deal it's not magic it's just plain software that you could do on your own if you have enough time that's it so uh, next question is why do you need to know this so basically the like, current all research right now is done using deep learning frameworks no one says i got a good idea things say i would have a good idea let me code it from scratch no it all happens like implemented on a deep learning framework so and deep learning framework like tensorflow keras tiano they form the backbone of deep learning research and it helps you and it sets you apart from other people when you understand what's happening in the background and this is a quote from arthur c clark that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic and yes deep learning frameworks are pretty complicated pieces of software and uh, even though we we use it on a daily basis it's always magical when you think that someone some humans wrote this so this talk is going to be about banishing that voodoo and showing that it's not that a complicated uh, thing and we'll find that these all have simple concepts that can be explained in an hour or an hour and a half and but the caveat is that it it's a bit complex to implement and once you know it you get more control over the deep learning frameworks and if you figure out that okay i need to have some kind of a feature that's not supported by any of them how do i make that on my own or how do i uh, use it on a special hardware because nowadays we're shifting over to mobile and uh, most deep learning frameworks don't support running it on mobile phones or for example raspberry pi so if you want to do it for those how you're going to do it Okay, so this is just a slide to show that these are the common frameworks that are available. You have Keras, you have Chainer, you have MXNet, which is supported by Amazon right now, Tiano from Mela, Yosho Benjo's lab, TensorFlow from Google, Torch from Facebook, Cafe from Berkeley, CNTK from Microsoft. Now, basically the question is why do we have so many frameworks if if as i claim that they all do the same thing why do we even have so many frameworks simple answer is why not i mean even linux if you take a look at it there's so many distros but underneath they're all the same linux kernel so it's just to have more diversity and also because these companies and organizations have a lot of resources and they have very 
niche requirements it doesn't make sense for them to depend on an external framework and try to change their work and modify their work depending upon what the framework support so you can see that Tiano from Mila and if you see most work from Benjo's lab it's implemented from in Tiano torches from Facebook and so most of the work is in uh, in torch CNTK from Microsoft the ResNet paper was implemented in CNTK and TensorFlow from Google. Well, most papers from Google and DeepMind are in TensorFlow. And the interesting thing is each of, so even though the concepts are same, each one of them does one particular thing very well. For example, Tiano is known for its fast implementation of RNNs. Torch is known for its uh, ability to give a very low level access to the deep learning uh, to the neural nets trying to change gradients and things like that cntk as they claim i've not tested it out is good in scaling and it scales out very well and so does mxnet and tensorflow is from google which is very flexible it has apis in uh, python java c plus plus and they say it can be extended to other libraries uh, other languages as well so it helps it it's more flexible and it has android support as well so there's that and now the question is are they really all that di all that different i mean is it like apples and oranges or is it apples and bridges comparison so the answer is no and that's what we're going to cover how they're di how they're similar and how they're different and you still see that the differences are not because they want to implement different concepts, but because they have difference in what kind of design choices they make. Okay, so next is uh, what I'll call this bare bones deep learning framework. So any deep learning frameworks will have the following components. It have it has tensors, and uh, don't worry if you're if you're not comfortable with the terms, we'll go through them in detail. So it has tensors, it has operations on these tensors, it has a computational graph, it has an auto differentiation module, it has fast and efficient floating point operations because uh, all the tensors have doubles of floats as uh, the data type and you'll be technically working on floating points and not integers. So you need to be able to do it very fast and use uh, your as hardware as much as possible. And then there's GPU support. I mean, current deep learning research uses GPUs almost on a daily basis. You don't get any papers on which say I ran the network on CPU and it's uh, it's just too slow. And for this, we have uh, libraries called BLAS, KuBLAS, KuDNN, which we'll cover uh, when we talk about implementations. Okay, and uh, to show that these uh, these are not just some co abstract concepts there but are in different uh, deep learning libraries i have some examples for example uh, in tensorflow you have the tensor tensor represented from through the tf.tensor api operations to tf.operation dot whatever you found add sub mal and then you have the graph computation graph represented as tf.graph and autodiff can be accessed through the tf.gradients and there are other uh, library i mean other functions and objects and modules available in tensorflow that you can look it up and kudnn and kubla uh, blast you need uh, these are packages that these are uh, linked to so when you look at the install notes of ask uh, where, where they say how do you how you could use gpus they'll tell you that you need to install kudnn and how and how you could use them in tensorflow and the same things in Tiano. Tiano has some um, Tiano.tensor. So if you take a look at any uh, Tiano code, they import, they say import Tiano.tensor as T, and then you see it being used multiple times in the code itself. And then you have ops where Tiano. Dot, there's a lot of operations over there, or Tiano.tensor.operations. So you can look them up. And, and these are all hyperlinks. So if you check the PDF, you can open up the corresponding documentation for that. And the graph is in Tiano.gof, GOF, as they call it. It's the backend that they use for compiling uh, dot .graph. Auto differentiation can be accessed by Tiano.tensor.grad. Kudian and Kublas, again, you can look at their uh, instructions, installation instructions, and see that 
uh, how they use the how they use these libraries for uh, in the performance. Okay, so let's start with the first the component tensors. So what are tensors? They're nothing but uh, mathematical objects, and so in a less abstract terms, they're just n-dimensional arrays. For example, a vector is like a one D array because it has only one dimensions with some ten numbers. A matrix is a two D array which has rows and columns, and a tensor is basically a generalization of those two n dimensions, like three dim, three D. For example, a three D matrix is a, it's actually a three D tensor, four D, five D, and uh, these are not abstract terms, but these are some things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis in tensor uh, while dealing with deep learning networks. And I'll give you an example of that later on. So, and um, NDRA, so tensors, if you've used NumPy, you would have seen that a NumPy dot NDRA that you use to create uh, arrays. So this is a tensor implementation in NumPy. And like I said, it's the lingua franca in uh, deep learning frameworks. People don't deal with, uh, the deep learning networks don't deal with images or audios. It's basically the follows this kind of a flow. It starts with data. You have uh, text, video, audio, and you convert them to tensors. You throw it in a deep learning net, deep neural net, and you get out output tensors. Probably like a, after softmax layer, you have a probability distribution, and then you do a pre post processing on that and get out your results. So this allows um, a clean abstraction, and it allows your uh, deep learning framework to be used in multiple scenarios. I'll come to what I mean by deep, uh, what I mean by clean uh, abstraction is that a neural net sees only tensors. It says sees, okay, 5D matrix of size, uh, 5 cross 5 cross 5 and so on with these numbers. It doesn't see, okay, I'm getting an audio, I'm getting a video. So this kind of an abstraction helps you to use, try to use the same architecture or different uh, different use cases and different data sets. So that helps in portability in a way. So let's take a small example of how an image is represented as tensors. And okay, so what you have here is a bitmap image of, uh, I guess this is 270 cross 3, 340 image. And this is in bitmap, that means it's uh, R, it has three colors, RGB and it's of size uh, 270 and 340. So let's just split it out from channels. So this is the red channel. So basically this is the intensity of the red red color component of each pixel. This is the green channel and this is the blue channel. So so if you take take a 3D RGB image like this, so it's like for each location you have three numbers which says the the uh, red, red intensity green intensity and the blue intensity and this constitutes an image so as you can see it's a 3d 3d tensor right so you can see here that row and column it says the coordinate of the pixel so you can see the third in the third row in the second column you see this number 111 this is uh, nothing but the intensity of red the intensity of blue green and the intensity of blue and so this is pre tensor so tensors are not an abstract mathematical thing that people came up it's very real and people use it daily and some other examples are videos videos are nothing but 4d tensors because if you look at it a video is nothing but stacks of images right and they're moving so fast that you see that they are, it's, see it as a video so a video frame is an image so the, the next three uh, the 3d is for each image pixel intensity and the fourth dimension is which frame of the uh, video that you're looking at so that's a 4d tensor words have something like a word to vec which is, which could be like a 500 200 200 dimension or 50 dimension no representation and uh, not sure if there was a no talk on word to it but if you guys are interested we can do it later and characters can be represented as one hot embeddings basically one hot embedding is like so suppose if i have a text and you want to represent each character as numbers so the one way to do it is let's assume that the text has only uh, alphabet lowercase alphabets so a b c up to z so that's a uh, 26 letters 
and so you can have a 26 dimensional MIP vector and uh, of all zeros and for example if the word is a the rep the first uh, the first uh, dimension would be one so it will be one followed by 25 zeros or if it's say z the last one would be one follow uh, which was uh, preceded by 25 zeros so that's a one hot embedding usually it's uh, used for character representations but it has its own for pitfalls because to represent one character you need to use 26 bits which is a lot of wasted uh, wasted memory and for and next is audio which is represented as spectrograms or spectrograms or other ways so basically effect, uh, spectrogram would be like for each uh, at each um, time interval what frequencies are observed so this is one way to represent audio another way would be to represent it in the frequency domain which frequency is coming with which intensity at which time so that's how tensors are being used and uh, if you want more information we could uh, have another um, another talk on how to use word to work or one hot embeddings okay so the next one is operations so the first was tensors and the next is operations so by operations i mean operations to be done on tensors and if you think about a neural net it has layers right so for example a simple a three layer fully connected network has three layers of sigmoids for example and each sigmoid layer is operating on an input tensor and throws out an output tensor okay so these uh, these are the uh, that's how a neural network is implemented it's implemented as a succession of operations and of course in a deep learning framework we can always say operations and like i said uh, neural nets are if you look at it, it's just a composition of operations and we could just say uh, let the users implement but the problem is that whenever users implement they try to implement in a high level language like python which though it's easy to program it it results in suboptimal code where all the resources are not used properly and another thing is it's prone to bugs so there'll be more dev this different developers will be trying to implement the same uh, operations and that would raise a lot of bugs that would cause developer head headaches not just for the users but also for the developers who get who get the github rep repositories filled with issues saying that hey i tried implementing this it's not working because uh, and people raise issues saying that it's a problem with the library and not their implementations and moreover for example if you want to use gpus then programming gpus is a challenge of its own so it's you, you'd rather not uh, implement everything from scratch and um, another problem is that uh, for example if a user is writing a neural net for say a gpu and then he wants to deploy it on android or on a cpu machine because inference is way cheaper than learning he needs to rewrite this entire co code again so it's just a lot of work and it's more difficult to extend to new hardware and software versions because the api change and but so it makes sense to support basic and widely used operations and by basic i mean things like adding two tensors subtracting two tensors multiply divide exponential log and when i mean all of these these are like element wise operations so adding two tensors just means that adding each of the corresponding components or uh, subtracting is the same and multiplication you could do matrix multiplication on tensors as well so div exponential and logarithms are all element wise and not just basic operations like this sometimes people and actually a lot of people a lot of fra all frameworks actually implement a higher level operations like convolution pooling lstm units because um, you know, all neural nets nowadays have these and then for another one is the sigmoid function that I'll dis discuss next. So for example, this is the sigmoid layer. You have the hidden layer, which is basically the uh, previous, the output of the previous layer. And you can see that uh, these the biases that you add, uh, node one, node two, node three, basically you're getting input from three um, neurons. And you have a sigmoid function over here, which is one over one plus e to the power minus w transpose x plus b 
where w is the weight of the sigmoid layer and uh, w sorry x is these node 1 node 2 node 3 inputs and b is the bias so you have a multiplication over here and then you have an output layer you can run another sigmoid and then get the output for so sigmoid layer could be represented simply as 1 over 1 plus np dot exp for uh, this expression which is basically the sigmoid layer expressed as uh, numpy one line of numpy so it's always pretty cool uh, numpy is pretty cool library because it's such a complicated thing if you were to implement then you have to do all the dot product you have to do the matrix transfer uh, transposes uh, transpose on your own but in numpy it's just one liner and it's blazingly fast so that's about uh, operations. The next uh, topic is a computational graph. So a computational graph is nothing but uh, a combination of multiple operations. So like I said before, neural nets have basically an op after an op after an op. So computational graph just represents the entire uh, collection of collection of operations and the relations between them in a graphical way. So. Uh, and this is similar to abstract syntax trees. Like I said uh, earlier, deep learning has a lot of old wine and new bottles. So this again is from compilers. And uh, if you take your compiler books and take uh, go go to abstract syntax trees, you'll see the exact operate a uh, tree uh, image that I'm going to show you there. But in terms of compilers and not in deep in terms of frameworks. So this is an example of a uh, computational graph. So suppose we want to compute E equals C times D and we have C is computed as A plus B and D is computed as B plus 1. So and these are the inputs A and B. So C to compute C you need A and B and then to compute D you just need B and then to compute E you need C and D. So in a, in a simpler example of how this can be seen in a neural net is just consider this line and let this be a sigmoid layer so a times a sigmoid is the output for example so this is how you could visualize neural nets as as computational graphs as well so the question is why do you need it like okay it's a graphical way to represent operations it helps you visualize and things like that so that's a good to have feature why the, why should it be a core part of the deep learning framework. The reason is that it helps you get a bigger picture of the network and why do you need it is um, it helps you run something called this auto differentiation on the network. I'll come to this later but basically auto diff is how uh, back propagation is run on networks and it helps in allocating resources to get the best performance. For example, if you have a CPU and a GPU, so the question is basically which operations do you put on GPU, which operations do you put on CPU, or in cases where you have multiple GPUs, so the question again arises, which operation do you put on which GPU, and when do you organize, for example, uh, when do you when do you say okay this operation should be done then next is how do you schedule operations so all this can be done only if you have an idea of all the all the operations that are available that are needed to be done so having a bigger picture helps you allocate resources much better and it also helps in doing some optimizations basic for example if you have let me stay, go back to the previous slide to give you an example okay for here uh, if you look over here d is just b plus one and so let's say if you have another layer another operation here okay so let's say you have another operation here which says b plus one again Oops. right so if you have b plus one over here it's you see that these two operate this of these two operations are wasteful you can just combine them together to say d equals b plus two so this is a kind of optimization that you can do only when you have a bigger picture you cannot have this if only you know which operations are doing you need to have a bigger picture to be able to do things like this like uh, re reducing two additions into one and other examples as well and it helps to have a encapsulation and a clean API. For example, 
uh, what I mean by encapsulation is that when you're doing inference or learning, you, you do it on the entire network. You don't do it on each one of the layers. So it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to just show uh, different layers, expose them and tell the user to figure it out itself. It makes more sense to wrap them up in a nice a computational graph object and then a call and farm method on that say graph dot for example in uh, keras you have graph dot predict or graph dot uh, train on batch for example which takes which does this for you the entire thing from start to end and doing back propagation so this helps in having cleaner much cleaner code and much easy to use apis and like I said before, it also helps in orchestra orchestration of uh, operations because uh, since there is like a sequential a way of, of things happening on the graph, for example, op2 requires the outputs of op1 to do its work. So that means you need to schedule op operation one on the GPU first, then get its output All right, so Malay asked a question that why should it be auto differentiation and why can't it be a uh, symbolic differentiation? That's a good question and I will come to that later. I'm just giving you an idea of what to do here, what what is there in the deep learning frameworks and then I'm trying to give, I'm trying to justify why these are there and why only these are enough to have a bare bones deep learning framework. So coming back, uh, orchestration of operations. So if op2, op3 requires the output of op2, you need to first schedule operation 2 on a GPU and get a notification that it's done before you can run op3. So all this can be done only when you have an, uh, a bigger picture. You cannot have, do it if you have just one, just the uh, operational view of the things. Okay, so now the most important thing how do you train neural networks? How do you run back propagation on these? And this was uh, the Malay, uh, what Malay had asked. There's uh, the two things called auto differentiation and symbolic. So what we want to do is we want to have something which is more general than back propagation because if you've taken your uh, if you've read any deep learning books or machine learning books in general, they just simply say, oh, we we have a feed forward network and we do back propagation on this but current architectures are much more complicated their branches going out for example uh, uh, in google net that uh, we had to talk about later they're uh, they're uh, skipping layers and the different things that if th that is difficult to express in terms of back propagation but it's easy to express in terms of uh, computational graphs because you can see that as a computational graphs and then we could do a uh, calculus on that which we'll be talking about next so what we're doing is calculus as in computing gradients uh, in the computational graph and one one common thing that we do is called our chain rule which i'll show you the equations for tomorrow i mean in the next uh, slide and there are two things with the when you want to do differentiation that's something called dif uh, symbolic differentiation and something called auto differentiation so what symbolic differentiation is, is to analytically find the gradients of each operation that is by using chain rules. For example, if we have z equals f of y and y equals g of x, so you can look g, g is operation 1 and f is operation 2. So you can write z as output. So this would be z would be f of g of x. So that means it's something like a two layer network. And if you want to find the gradient, this is how you do it. You, the derivative of z with respect to x is uh, derivative of z with respect to y because z is the input of z is y, and then derivative of y uh, uh, with respect to x because y depends on x. So this is how you do it. But the problem here is that you cannot calculate it for all functions. In some cases, it's just too difficult because you have a, a fancy integrals for example, in terms of convolution, and in some cases, it's just not possible because, uh, for example, in RNNs, there, it's looping over and over again. So, how do you calculate the calculate the gradient? I'll come to these later. So, symbolic differentiation, though it's nice to have, it's uh, cannot be used. It's not uh, used for all operations. 
and not just some fancy operations that people can come up but even with day to day even with common uh, generally used deep learning uh, operations like convolutions it gets difficult so the alternative is called an auto differentiation which is just another approach to tackle the chain rule it's basically it goes like this you compute the gradient for each uh, operation for example in here you just compute f dash of y g dash of x and again uh, i'll come to how you compute that and then when you traverse the graph you just collect the gradient for each operation like i'll uh, we'll use the example that i discussed earlier and i'll show you how the gradient flows and so what you do is you go traverse the graph you get the gradient and as per the chain rule you have to multiply them right so you get it multiply multiply and then you have the then that's your back propagation which works in general it doesn't worry about whether you have loops or skips you just follow the links you collect the gradients and you compute the difference and you do back propagation and it can be done in both forward and backward directions like depending upon your use case of by forward i mean from input to output and by backward i mean from uh, output to input so the backward direction is from where the name back propagation came from so going back to our example from earlier it's uh, c r uh, e equals c times d where a and b are inputs and c is computed as the computer as the sum of a and b and d is computed as b plus 1 so these you can see from this link to link you can compute the d d uh, partial derivative of d with respect to d uh, b in this link you can compute the partial derivative of d with respect to e and in this link you can compute the partial derivative of e with respect to c so while traversing through this uh, this um, link you only need to know these partial derivatives you don't need to know partial derivative of d with uh, e with respect to d this one because it does the gradient uh, the term that you use is the gradient doesn't flow that gradient doesn't flow in this direction so the partial derivative d with respect to e flows only here not in the other way one so as you can see this is a simple example but you can realize that this can be generalized to much more complicated neural networks and that's why we use auto differentiation or symbolic because it's just easier to scale as well as easier to compute however uh, if you are although there's still one uh, thing that's left how do you compute the gradient for each operation because you know we talked about comp uh, co collecting the gradients but how do you compute this delta sorry how do you compute this delta c del c by del a because that's still a challenge so for this we have a simple if you have it's easy to compute then you just calculate the gradients or if not you have other ways to do it so to do that let's take a small intermission and have an aside called uh, subgradients so what subgradients are is the, uh, subgradients usually come in cases of relu which is rectified linear unit or leaky relu uh, and there's uh, there are other variants as well so the problem is that these are not differentiable for example if you see over here right if there's this inflection point so if you're trying to gray calculate the gradient over here uh, it's uh, it's not possible analytically even if you use the um, basic definition of a gradient uh, of a derivative uh, it says derivative does not exist over there similarly here as well you see that there's an inflection point so when you're approaching from the left you'd say uh, it's say what well, it was x x uh, ai times xi so the gradient from the left side is ai while coming from the right side you'll see the gradient is one so these two do not converge at x equals zero and you see the gradient doesn't exist so what we do instead is have an approximation like i said we don't have an uh, we, we can't differentiate at x equals zero so you approximate it and the way that you do it is uh, called a subgradient which is basically an approximation to gradients and it gives the greatest lower bound so let me show you how what that means suppose this is a function that you have 
Okay, it, 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 this is this looks like a piecewise continuous function with inflection points over here. Let me just change the color. Oh, green seems good. So you have inflection points here, here, and here. So when you want to compute the gradients over here, you cannot uh, do it analytically because they, those are the grade, uh, the derivatives discontinue. So what you do instead is you have a line like this, this line for example, which uh, which at x zero it's equal to the function. So let's say this is g. So g of x zero g of x0 equals f of x0 okay so at this point a subgradient have satisfies the property that if g is subgradient then at, g, at x0 it has the same value as the function and also in other points it's always strictly less than the function so if you can see at this point G, uh, G has a lower value than F. Similarly over here, G has a lower value than F and so on. So that's the definition of a subgradient and uh, I'm not going into the proofs but this is a good approximation of a approximation for gradients at uh, a point x0. So that's how you compute uh, gradients for, for non-differentiable functions and even for convolutions as well, what they do is they are uh, converted into uh, they do a Fourier transform and then it's easier to differentiate over there. But uh, without going to much of the mathematics, that's how they do it. And another interesting thing is how do you compute uh, gradients for RNNs or recurrent neural networks? RNNs basically have the output of the same layer as the input, but in the next time step, so to speak. So the function is something like the output at t plus 1 is a function of some inputs as well as the output in the previous time step. So the problem is how do you run back propagation on this? If you if you represented this as a computational graph, you clearly see that there's a loop. So you go how you just loop and loop and loop and loop and you just calculate compute gradients so much and what happens is you keep computing small you keep multiplying small numbers and this either small numbers or large numbers and then this results in something called this exploding gradients wherein it just keeps going so much that a floating point number cannot hold the number uh, it just overflows or it just you multiply small numbers like 0 0.001 uh, or 10 to the power minus y you just keep multiplying it five times and it becomes 10 to the power minus 25 which is no longer uh, which may not be representable anymore in a, a double precision number so what you do is you do something called this loop controlling and this was a um, image that i took from uh, christopher ola's uh, blog post so what you do is if if this is the rnn layer with the loop over here so what you do is you unfold it so at, uh, at, at t equals 0, the output is h0, and at t, uh, t equals 1, the uh, inputs are x1 and the h0 over here, basically, you can show it like this, and the output is h1, and then you roll it up to, say, instead of time, you can roll it up to infinity, right, because it's just, if you have infinite time prime, you can keep rolling it, but let's say you can roll it only up to, let's say, 5, and you hold it there, you'll say, okay, this is my R10 and I'm going to unroll it to 5 and I'm going to keep it like that. And then you compute the gradient on that. You can compute for here the gradient, it flows like this, right? So uh, to compute to see how gradients flow, you just reverse the direction of the arrow. So the gradient from HT flows like this. And so, so you can keep uh, you can unfold it to say only five times and say, okay, this is how I'm gonna compute my gradients. 
this will not be the exact values obviously because you're instead of doing it for infinite you're just approximating with a finite number of unrollings but like we did in subgradients there are there are results that say okay this is good enough with a certain epsilon tolerance which means that the actual gradient and the computer gradient differ only by epsilon which is okay because we are, we are there is a notion there's a small amount of stochasticity in the way that you learn so we can tolerate small small deviations so are we done with just uh, the un unrolling it say five times and you are we done no we still can cause underflows and overflows because let's say you if you have only just five and let's say the input gradient is 10 power minus 20 okay so if, I, uh, if you do that 10 power minus 20 times 10 power minus 25 times you get 10 power minus 100 which again can cause overflows i mean underflows or if it's 10 power 20 it can cause overflows so the the loop by unrolling we resolve the looping issue but we still not have uh, we still haven't resolved the underflows or the overflows so what they do for this is called uh, gradient clipping what happens in gradient clipping is basically you allow numbers only between uh, you say that the gradient g can be only less than equal to x0 let's okay not x let's because x, x is our input and a2 okay so this is called a gradient clipping okay I can't really, sorry about that so this is called gradient clipping so whenever the gradient goes below a1 it's pushed to a1 and whenever it goes above a2 it's pushed back to a2 so that it's always between a1 and a2 and these two numbers are chosen in such a way that they cover a large range of gradients uh, uh, but still keeping but still being represented by double precision numbers so that's how you do back propagations on rnn so these are these two okay just a moment all right these two are the way that you can these two are the ways how you can compute not not so straightforward ways of calculating gradients now now that we've spoken talk, talked about conceptual ways of how deep learning world frameworks work now it's time to get dirty with the data details and actually talk about how these are implemented so as a quick re recap, these are the components of a deep learning framework, the tensors, the operations, there's a computational graph, there's auto differentiation, which is which is what we talked uh, just before, like how do you compute gradients on a, on a computational graph, and then you have a fast and efficient floating point operations and GPU support, which we'll be talking about now. Okay, so before we go a fundamental question that we need to answer is how do we represent say tensors or how do we represent operations do we represent them as functions or do we represent them as classes so representing as functions makes more sense because we are taking in an input we're computing something and we're returning back a value that sounds exactly like a function what a function is that's maybe perhaps that's the definition of a function in from CS101 and another advantage is that there's lesser memory footprint because you're not storing anything you're just taking something computing and sending it back and and there's a logical mapping between drawing it as a you know sigmoid function to a sigmoid function implementation but however if you were to represent operations as classes it helps in better encapsulation so by encapsulation i mean you may need other information like shape what's the shape of the tensor so that maybe you need to check if the if it's only a 3d tensor or a 4d tensor because you may for example convolutions usually the, you do do it on 2d convolu 2d 
inputs or 3D inputs, you can't you can't say give it a five five dimensional tensor and ask it to go figure it out. So you may want to do things like what's your shape and size, and also uh, if you represent operation operations as classes, you can have two functions inside one for computing the forward operation. Basically, in case of sigma, for example, if I give you an input, say let's call that function as dot apply. So sigmoid dot apply of x will give me run the sigmoid on the input tensor x and give out a value. And if you want a backward uh, operation or if you want to compute gradients, you can have another function which uh, which which stores how to compute the gradient for that operation. And also you can have something like an abstract class which has uh, functions that any operation has to implement which you can inherit and then do things. It, it helps in scaling and extending frameworks. For example, if you want to write your own operation, how do you how do you make sure that your operation works well and works good works well with the other operations in the framework? So using an abstract class class helps you to have contracts saying that this operation will have a function called apply which will apply the operation or an up, a function called grad which will run the back propagation but however there's a catch that classes have a higher memory footprint because these will be allocated memory on the uh, on the heap and and this will take up more memory than having a function but however memory is cheap cheap dev time isn't so mem it's easy to get extra 16 GBs of RAM or 1 TB of hard disk. Maybe caches are a bit expensive, but still. But however, getting an extra developer is much more expensive than getting a RAM, extra RAM. So it's better to have, a, even if it's their uh, higher footprint, it improves uh, developer efficiency. So classes are for the win. Even though functions make logically, logical mapping easier, functions help I mean, objects help to have a better uh, abstraction and it helps imp improve productivity. Okay, so <clears throat> now that we have agreed upon the fact that all the uh, operations has to be objects, so naturally tensors uh, should be also objects because they are those are an array. You can't just given um, it's uh, you cannot have a raw API for uh, tensors. So even tensor objects are. Uh, tensors are objects and what do, what does an object tensor object need to do it needs to be able to convert data to tensors and back and what I mean by converting data to tensors is for example I showed you the example of the uh, uh, the, uh, the image early on for example if you have an image you want to be able to convert it to tensors let's say call it as T and then you need to be able to convert the tensor back into images for example if you're running a GAN, generator adversarial networks, and the output again output would be a tensor. So how do you change it back to an image so you can see what's happening? So it needs to be able to do that. And since, of course, uh, tensors are ND arrays, it needs to have an efficient way to store arrays, not as, for example, arrays or linked lists, or, or for example, it might need a it might be a sparse matrix for uh, where a lot of numbers are zero. So you need to have efficient ways to store the matrix such that the memory that you use is minimized. And it, it needs to have other metadata something like shape, type, average, min, max. Let me just remove the marking. So it needs to have metadata types like shape what's the shape of the uh, of the tensor it's two cro five cross five cross five for example is the shape and what type are the they uh, are the data is it floating point or is integer or its character and for you could have other uh, other frequently used uh, metadata like average on minimum and maximum for example average you could have average for tensors because uh, you know, in images because one of the common pre-processing steps that you do is you take images and uh, you minus the mean across all the images so that uh, it it's between it's between a fixed value i mean it's in a finite range instead of going to going expanding the, over, in the entire range 
So this is one of the common pre-processing steps that's used in CNNs, like subtracting the mean. So it's better to have the mean for each of the tensors that you could use later on instead of computing it again and again. And of course, min and max, if uh, some other use cases might need it. And it has to support things like splicing and views. What I mean by splicing is like in Python, you can get, uh, say, five, five colon, sorry. Okay, splicing would be like, I, sorry about that. Okay, splicing is uh, something like uh, accessing a subarray of a subarray of the tensor or sub tensor. For example, if you have an array of five ele ten elements and you want to access from the second element to the third uh, to the seventh ele to the fourth element or something like that, it needs to be able to support the angular braces that you find in NumPy and by general Python arrays. And the difference between splicing and views is that splicing when you say in a 10 uh, an array with 10 elements if you want uh, if you want to splice it between the second and say the eighth it creates a new array bit of the elements from the second to the eight uh, elements and gives you back whereas view just gives you a view in the sense that the background of the in the back end the object is the same it's just that it's a new uh, meta tensor which lets you access from the second to the eighth element alone. So that's the difference between splicing and views. Uh, just a moment, there's a question from uh, Pranay Mathur. Uh, he asks, uh, can you give an example of derivatives involved in BPTT? Uh, what's uh, PPTT coming? So yeah, I'm just asking for a clarification on that part. All right, uh, it's back propagation to time. An example would be in a in just an. LSTM case where you can just a moment. Okay, so BP. Uh, there was a question which asked, "Can I give an example of a derivative involved in BPTT?" And BPTT is back propagation to time. Yes, you could. Uh, you could have like RNN stem cells as. Uh, RNN stem cells as like running through time. Like the first second character, the second character could be uh, assumed to come in the next time step. So and then when back propagation, then there is just uh, I can show you the under, let me just show you the unrolled thing. Yeah, hello. So, um, I'm just checking the live feed. Yeah, it's saying that it's not healthy. Or should I restart or? No, there's, uh, it's, there's nothing else running on the machine. Uh, it's fine now or is it still buffering or? <laughs> 
Okay, so shall I continue? Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, going back to the question back propagation to trine, uh, I'll, I'll show you that example right now. Like we have the example on back propagation to on RNNs, right? So you can use this for, for example, xc, h of x0, you can always say it's the input at t equals 1. So this can be represented as t equals 1. This is a... Uh, T2, T3 and so forth and back, back propagation over here would be basically running as a back propagation over time. It's the same layer but when you unroll it, it's like at different time steps. Okay, so that's one simple example of BPTT. So on the continuing where I left, the tensor objects yes so what does a tensor object consist of it consists of the an efficient storage of uh, storage of arrays uh, along with metadata such as shape type average min max and it should support splicing and views and also like i discussed it should have support for sp sparse matrices what i mean by sparse matrix is if you have a matrix and if a large a significant number of uh, elements are zero and uh, then it's called a spare sparse matrix because you don't have to store those zeros you just have to store the non-zero values and say any other element is zero now the question is how much is significant that depends upon the use case so in these cases it doesn't make sense to store all the zeros it makes sense only to store the non-zero values and their locations so that's a way for uh, that's called uh, the that's a smart matrix representation and it is common in neural networks whenever you use things like relu or max out layers most these um, in relu if you remember the activation for any inputs less than zero is uh, zero so you can imagine that on an average if half the in half the inputs to the relu layer of negative then the ha half the outputs would be zero so in these cases we need to have uh, support for sparse matrix representations and how to run operations on the sparse matrix because a simple matrix multiplication which access the different rows and elements won't work here because when you access a row and a column in which the element is zero you need to handle it saying that okay this is a zero element and I need to send back zero and then you need to have something like integrity checks GPU transfers and compression Integrity checks are basically uh, suppose if you're deploying this on a uh, on a commodity so uh, cluster wherein there are multiple uh, multiple systems running the neural net and you need to set transfer the tensors from one 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 uh, node to another so it's possible that the data can get corrupted during communication so you need to make sure that what I sent and what I received are the same. People do it using like MD5s, hash sums, things like that. So depending upon what you're building this for, you might need to have uh, support for integrity checks. And even for example, when you're using GPUs, you might need to, you need to transfer the data from the uh, CPU to the GPU, run some computations and get it back. Because when you code something and when you start, say, I don't train dot mod dot by, it means that the the program starts on the CPU, then it creates the objects and then sends it to GPU. Then it sends, okay, I need to do these computations on the tensor, do it. And once that's done, you take it back. So it needs to be, it needs to have uh, support for transferring it to GPU and back. And I call this compression. Compression is needed when you want to talk over network or any kind of communication. It, uh, it's good to have compression to reduce the overheads of communication. So these are just uh, what uh, tensor objects should uh, contain.
And another point that I want to make here is this is not an exhaustive list, nor is it like a necessary list. What I mean by it's not an exhaustive list is that it's these are not the only features that a tensor object must have. There might be other uh, features that you want to have it depending upon your use case. Uh, and also you don't need to implement all of these. For example, if you are if you know that you're gonna run it only on one uh, GPU, you don't have to worry about integrity or one node with a single GPU. You don't have to worry about integrity checks or compression. And if you're okay with um, having letting pass, uh, since you're using working on small neural networks, if you're okay with uh, uh, wasting memory in terms of space, sparse matrices, you can avoid uh, this as well. So it's just a positive, it's uh, just a list of things that's good to have and that any good deep learning framework should have, but it doesn't mean that all frameworks will have it or these are the only things that are there with all the frameworks. So I just wanted to make that point here because when we discuss other classes and object as well, you'll see similar lists and the same holds there as well. So the next is the operation class or op class for short. And for one, the first thing is uh, it should have input sanity checks. For example, if uh, it's if uh, you are expecting only floating point uh, inputs and you get an integer, you might want to throw an error saying that you got an integer uh, may a tensor instead of a floating point or you can just type cast it. Uh, or if you're expecting only a 3D, uh, 3D tensor and you get a 5D tensor, you want to throw an error saying that too many dimensions or if you get a 2D tensor, you can uh, throw an uh, exception saying that too little dimensions. <coughs> Excuse me. And then obviously uh, it needs to have an optimized implementation and by optimized it could be like should be optimized on CPU as well as on GPU. So depending upon the use case and how you implement it, uh, the optimizations might vary and of course uh, this that was for the forward propagation and for the backward propagation you need to have uh, a method for using which you could compute the gradient and uh, again another thing is in you, you can given an input uh, size tensor and you know your operations you can predict the output tensor shape without uh, actually performing the operation because Operations are deterministic and you can say that if for example, let's take a uh, matrix multiplication as one of the ops So if you have a, let me see if I can write it here. Oh, okay, so if you have an n times p a matrix As your input and you have a p times uh, Say m As your weight, so you want to cal calculate say for example a uh, w transpose x which is just this is a linear layer so if you want to and you know that let's say x is uh, p times m and the okay so it, uh, can it be yes it can and w transpose is n times p now without actually computing the uh, the, the, the product let's say if this is y i can say that this would be n times m okay i don't have to compute uh, the matrix product between w and x to get the uh, y and then see its dimension so when you know the shape of the output tensor then you can say that uh, you can use this for sanity checks over the network for example if you describe only the shape of the input and then you run several operations and then later on uh, you've done say for example four operations and the fifth operation needs to do a sanity check whether I'm getting a, a reasonable when uh, expected as shape it can just uh, get the shape of the output tensor from the fourth operation instead of actually running a computation so this helps in reducing errors and doesn't add much in terms of uh, memory or computation time uh, just uh Okay, and apart from this, uh, like I said, we need an optimize, optimized implementations. Usually, op implementations could be done in C++ or CUDA. For example, in Python, what uh, in Theano, what they do is for CPU-bound operations, they just have it in uh, implemented in Python, but using NumPy, which 
NumPy again uses something uh, called Cyton and C, which is pretty fast. Or if you take TensorFlow, their backend is written in C++, so which is again fast. And if you have, want to have GPU uh, support, you need to write it in CUDA. So usually you have uh, implementations in one for CPU and one for GPU. So there, there are objects, there are methods which have uh, implementations in C++ and CUDA. And then next, uh, if you remember our discussion from the uh, computational graphs, we said that uh, we need a computational graph to efficiently allocate resources. So, and each op class, op can say, hey, I need to run on GPU because it's much faster for me to run on a GPU than on a CPU. And some operations can say that, okay, it's, uh, I mean, the difference between running on a GPU and CPU is not so much. So you can allocate on me, allocate me on a GP, uh, CPU. So this could be just a Boolean flag saying, is GPU, yes or no. And also another uh, another thing to have is to have references to the parent and children op. So if you if you look at a computational graph, it's uh, something like this, right? So could be more than one. So it comes from parents. and it could go to children as well so the it, it this operation this op class should have reference to the parents like from where are you getting your inputs from and also from chil to its children where are you sending your ops uh, where outputs to so this helps in having the representation for a computation graphs and uh, and for back propagation for propagation as well so for for, for prov forward propagation you need to know which nodes take your outputs so that you can send them there and for uh, the backward propagations you need to know where you got your outputs inputs from so that you can flow let the gradient flow over here and over here and here so these are what uh, should be there ideally in an operation op class and like i said before this is not an exhaustive list nor is it uh, a bare minimum it's like it's a good to have list and next for the computation graph object, the components that you need, like I said, it's a container uh, class which has references to the different uh, uh, op ops which are in the network and it has reference to ops and the input and the output tensors. It should have graph traversal routines, both forward and backward for uh, forward for inference and backward for learning. And it should uh, be able to say that okay, um, how how do you who take get a lock on a GPU and how do you assign tensors to there and the operations over there and how do you get back, how do you free the memory from GPU or from other nodes. And like I said, it should have uh, methods to send tensors, tensors over there and get back results. So these two are different because uh, these two are different because in. Uh, in device allocation you need to first get a lock on a gpu by getting a lock it's uh, a way of uh, making sure that no other operation is working on the gpu right now or no other um, operation data is being stored in that part of the gpu so once you get a lock then you send inputs the tensors over there and the operations over there and you let it you let it run and you get back the outputs from there and a method to run auto diff which uh, goes which traverses the graph and collects the gradients from uh, collects a gradient from each of the operation and then tells it okay your gradient uh, since i got the errors from the your pa your children as this this should be your gradient and uh, it it updates the weights as well okay so these are what uh, should be there in a uh, graph object and finally, uh, the auto differentiation. Uh, this is a common mantra in uh, software development: is don't reinvent the wheel. Auto differentiation is not something that's uh, unique to unique or new to deep learning. It's been used in other places as well. For example, in fluid dynamics or CFD computation fluid dynamics, where it's they're trying to simulate differential equations. They need uh, auto differentiation tools. And therefore, there is a huge list of uh, auto differentiation modules that, we, that you could just plug in and you could just call uh, 
routines from there and get done so this is one list that i found which has not just for python but for multiple uh, languages at the order differentiation modules and just some of the example that i uh, saw in python that i felt were good and and i had i've spoken with people who have uh, used themselves and i've tried using them myself and they were nice so cgt is computational graph toolkit it's from berkeley and it has a very uh, very nice uh, interface for auto differentiations and it's pretty fast and autograd is from uh, harvard and it's uh, it's also a pretty good uh, toolkit as well so you could check them out if you want to do it in python and uh, tensorflow and uh, tiano and tensorflow use their own implementation of uh, uh, of uh, auto gradient because uh, they 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 realized they didn't want to use these and they'd rather implement it on their own because they have the resources and they'd like to keep their uh keep to keep their framework as uh, as a whole component instead of trying to rely on other uh, modules but if you're doing it on your own as an individual developer then it makes more sense to not waste time trying to implement it on your own but instead use libraries and the next question is uh, how do you support multi cores gpus and embedded because uh, deep learning today is run on a huge uh, variety of hardware right from your laptop pcs to jbog jbog stands for just a bunch of gpus which was uh, which was released recently by facebook as their uh, next generation gpu server and i think it has eight titan x's so how do you run it on that and or on some small device like a raspberry pi or your phone so how do you support these because people, programmers use your deep learning framework and it has to compile to code which can run on laptop pcs as well as server systems as well as raspberry pis and these are completely different hardware and each have their own strengths for example uh strengths and weaknesses for example laptop is portable and usually power is a concern jbox don't care about power and they're ex extremely uh, powerful and they have a lot of memory and compute so for example you you don't you might not have to worry about having a sparse representation because there's enough memory and raspberry pi has compute as well as uh power uh power constraints for example you cannot get more than so many watts on a raspberry pi and you cannot make it overheat so there are uh, things that constraints that you need to take care of things like power efficiency parallelism parallelism in terms of how do you use multiple gpus or multiple cores of your uh, pc uh, for example almost everyone today uses a multi core processor right in their laptop so how do you make sure make use of all the pro cores available instead of just one and if you are using on a cluster cluster scale how do you make sure that you uh, reduce your uh, network network communication and how do you handle things like uh, 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 integrity basically like how do you compute make sure that uh, the data that you send is what you uh, what you received it was the the data that you received is what the sender uh, sent and there's no corruption on the way so you need to uh, you need to think about these depending upon your use cases and for example uh, i like this example a lot because we take the raspberry pi it has low power and memory i think a latest of 1 gigabyte but the interesting thing is it has a gpu and it can support hd video and uh, uh, there was one uh, blog post which uh, talked about a guy who uh, who ran deep learning well, deep learning networks on on Raspberry Pi, but he had to go into the assembly and write his own uh, drivers to make sure that uh, the GPU GPU on the Raspberry Pi can be used because it's not an NVIDIA GPU, it's a Qualcomm GPU, I think. So you need to go through that and figure out how you can use it. So we need to make sure that these multiple hardware can be supported opaquely because the user should not be worried about what hardware am I running. Uh, it, the deep learning framework has to worry about, okay, this is what I have and this is how uh, the restrictions that I have and how should I use it, okay? So this is another constraint that, uh, that factors into the design of uh, the frameworks. 
and as you can see there's a lot of choices over here and depending upon your choice your complexity of the of the framework increases or decreases okay and uh, another way to do it another thing is that to use hardware op uh, efficiently there's another trick that people use they use optimized numerical libraries because like i said thanks to the op uh, thanks to the abstraction that we have at the bottommost uh, layer it's just different multi uh, tensors there's some matrix operations and you get an output tensor so these uh, tensors and matrices come in physics simulations mechanical engineering simulations civil whatever so then people have been working on this since the since computers came out and so they're very optimized numerical libraries uh, that you can exploit to have a better performance and optimizations and these are called blas or lapac blas stands for basic linear algebra sub programs and lapac stands for linear algebra packages so these are just collections of routines which uh, which are routinely routines which are commonly used in uh, linear algebra use cases for example matrix exponentiation matrix transpose or maybe finding the eigen values things like that so these have highly optimized and it's usually written in fortran or c and uh, you can uh, op you can just call you can send it the inputs you can call the functions get back the outputs and you can be assured that it's one of the fastest implementations around and in fact it's uh, sometimes people you write even assembly because uh, that's how you can get the most out of a system you write it in fortran or c which are low level languages but if you want to squeeze as much as as much performance as possible you need to write an assembly and some of these are so these are pretty good libraries and uh, these these have been in development since 80s and it has grown till then to support multi core as well so usually your frame when you're implementing a framework it would be like you have an op object which gets inputs and then when it says if you i want to do the operation it calls routines in blas or lapac with the uh, inputs and gets back the output it seldom does it on its own or it uses numpy which in turn calls blas okay and uh, like i said numpy uses them and we use routines for matrix operations and stuff coding them because again if you were to code it on your own they might it might be highly inefficient not worrying about locality or caches and things like that so an extension to this for gpus is uh, cuda and kublas so because uh, blas and laplac that i spoke about in the previous slides are like cpu only hardware i mean cpu only library and these have not been extended to uh, this have been expand expanded to N uh, the gpus nvidia cards per particular and through uh, libraries called cuda and kublas so cuda is a gpu programming api it exposes the gpu in the uh, gpu memory and the operations that you can have as an api and you can write it as a c code or c++ code or in python through pycuda you can write the code over there and compile it using nvcc instead of gcc and you can run the code on the gpu instead of on the cpu and it's very low level wherein you have to do your own memory management by memory management i mean you need to allocate your own memory you need to store your own values run the operations and then once the once you got back the uh, data you need to free the memory and things like that so a lot of low level implementation level uh, de details are left to you and because of this if you do it in the wrong way uh, it can lead to actually reduced performance than on a cpu for example if you just keep moving uh, data to and fro to and fro uh, the GP, uh, the your graphics card then what happens is the data transfer becomes the overhead and you cannot uh, and all the performance gains that you get by running it on a gpu are lost so instead what they did was they came up with again blast routines but for the gpu and it has it's very similar to the blast api 
for example if you had a function called mm mul which uh, which refers to matrix matrix multiplication in blas cuda blas would have a same similar method which called co mm mul which is which just means cuda matrix multiplication so it helps because they have such a similar api it's very easy if you know blast to just put it it's just a matter of adding a ku in front of the cu in front of the blast even in your routines and you're done and if you're not really in, uh, into this proprietary thing and not really wanting to stick to only nvidia because you feel it's like a monopoly there is another alternative called opencl which is in development and it works on both amd and nvidia and other graphics card available but it's in beta form and uh, not many people use it and it's, it's in still in development and not as performant as kublas but as far as i know tiano has uh, partial support for it and they're working on making sure that opencl can uh, that they have better support for opencl so that's something you can check it out if you want a completely open source deep learning stack okay and finally this is something um, most people would have heard of kudnn it's basically a library with deep learning prime primitives what i mean by this is that it has instead of uh, for example for a sigmoid later instead of calling matrix multiplication of wet w transpose x then an exponentiation and all that it has everything covered it, it's a much high, it's a higher level api and it's built on top of cuda and it has functions called like con2d and uh, the latest kudnn supports lstm as well so these are higher level apis that you can call and actually most deep learning frameworks use this in the background so again if you go back to the installation uh instructions for both tiano or, or tensorflow they have instructions on how to use kudnn and uh, in the background basically you install it as a library and then it will take care of it on its own and like i said it's high high level and it's highly optimized because you have people dedicated to developing this and who have also been involved in development of skuda and g on the gpu so they know how what's are going on in the background so that they have a very uh, optimized highly optimized uh, implementation so usually the how people use it is that they use vanilla the, the normal cuda uh, code for allocating memories and they run uh, run the computations using kudnn and, and then they you and they get back the data using cuda so this is a common use case that they do so finally uh, we are almost near the end of the talk so it's just a recap it's all connected so you have tensors for representing data you have some text or images you convert it into tensors and then you run operations on them so the general uh, framework is like you have a ten input tensor you run operations on it you get an output tensor you have a computation a computational graph so that it's clean Uh, and then a computational graph as like in a uh, computational graph will be like input oops sorry computation graph will be like there's an input and then there's first operation second operation third operation and so on nth operation and you get the output and then you have a uh, auto differentiation which which is a generalized back propagation and then you have and the back end blas or cuda or kublas or kudnn and implementation uh backends which are used for getting the best performance so this is all that there is in a, any deep learning framework and like if you want you can just open up for example say torch because i'm not given you the examples for that and then you can figure out like how it's representing tensors or how how what operations are there and what to come computation graph object over there and you can find that there's a very good mapping between what i've discussed here and with what's implemented over there so the next question is from here what do you do next well you can now that you know how things are implemented in the background then you you can explain that why your network is not training as fast as you expected you know for example if you wanted to i see this kind of issues in tiano's uh, 
issue tracker a lot. People come and say, hey, I was running on a CPU and I, I could run it on, you know, in uh, I could train it one one epoch took say uh, 10 minutes and uh, when i put it on a uh, gpu i was expecting at least a hundred times speed ups but i got like a 10 10x speed up only so what's happening so things like that you can you are better able to debug the issues and if you want to know more about exactly how these are implemented you can take a look at their internal documentation which is uh, which details how they implement it and I basically, I particularly found the Tiano's uh, documentation to be pretty elaborate. Uh, I personally found that TensorFlow was a bit less elaborate and I've not checked out the uh, docs for a Torch or PyTorch, but once you do go to the Tiano dev docs, it's, uh, you get to uh, appreciate how much they've uh, developed it. And if you want, you can, make your own deep learning framework just for fun and maybe it's pretty good people pick it up maybe another small suggestion is why not we make our own deep learning library as part of idli let's call it chutney and let's say we could just do it for uh, you know knowledge and if people are interested we could do it so you can start it just uh, only on cpus you can just write a uh, numpy code for how you can run convolutions or sigmoids or or LSTMs and then if people are interested we can go on to do the CUDA implementations as well so it's up to you guys any questions All right. So Jacob had one question on the stream. For fast computation, the computation graph operations must be converted to matrix operations for GPU. Is that right? Yes. It depends upon the operations. For sometimes, like convolutions, which are pretty fast on GPU when compared to CPUs. LSTMs sometimes not so much, because. Uh, you, like in a convolution you can see that the same operation is repeat it repeated over and over again like there's a sliding window and you do the same matrix operation so instead of like doing it sequentially like shifting it one by one by one you could just tell the gpu to do it all the sliding together at the same time and you get much better speed ups lstms uh, not so much because it's just an unrolling and you need there's a dependency because you need the uh, outputs of the previous uh, previous time step to compute the next uh, current time step and so on so there there's a dependency and G having parallelism does not help as much as say having parallelism and convolution Okay, and continue as a follow-up, he asks, uh, in that case, how is the forward propagation, inference and backward propagations mapped to op uh, matrix operations for GPU? So, well, mapping to matrix operations is pretty straightforward. Like, uh, if you really... Like in this, uh, for example, in this slide, we had uh, the sigmoid layer being converted to matrix operations directly. And uh, there's no sp special uh, hardware matrix operations for GPU. You compute them, you convert them into matrix operations, which could be run either on CPU or GPU. And then sometimes uh, to make sure that you can get as much parallelism as possible, you just change the ordering of the operation for example in matrix multiplication there's a three a three layered loop right first you go through the rows then you go through the columns and there's a third third row which computes the dot product so sometimes depending upon the locality you can shift over instead of going to the row first you could do to the columns first 
and then inside the columns you could have for each row. So that's more of a hardware specific implement uh, implementation details, but a mapping from from uh, for convolution or a sigmoid operation to a matrix operation is pretty straightforward without worrying about whether it's a CPU that's running or a GPU that's running. Once you do convert it, then you need to optimize for the hardware. So that's a bit of an uh, application specific uh, issue. And that's not something that I could elaborate completely, but depending upon if you give me a use case of say, if you want to do some operation on this hardware, how do I do it for efficiently? So that's a long discussion to have. Slides on the, uh, at the Facebook event page so you guys can check it out anytime you want and I'll be there on the Italy group and you can always ask me questions and it's always nice to have uh, discussions on the group so if there are no more questions then I can wind this up but before I do I should give credit where it's due and <clears throat> I'd like to thank Malai for proofreading the article because uh, I was discussing about you know these are so many things over there and people are not really aware of what's happening let's write an article about it and he said yeah let's do it and he, he after I wrote the article he helped me proofread it and uh, as well as he helped organizing and moderating this talk. So thank you, Malai. And definitely to the Indian Deep Learning Initiative. It's a wonderful group and there are a lot of awesome discussions. And it's one of the groups where I don't mind logging to Facebook to check it out. So that's a pretty cool thing. And I hope we can, we can have more interesting discussions and have more people there. And finally, to, and also to Frederick Bastin, he's the uh, Tiano lead developer and he was pretty helpful while I was uh, starting out. He was, uh, he spent time with me to un explain concepts and explain how they do things and that's, um, he took uh, time to explain all of that and I should obviously, uh, and what I know, most of the things that I know, I started from there. He was the one who explained, okay, you, you should try this out or that and so thanks and this and also to Chris Ola because most of the uh, most of the illustrations that I have here are taken from his blog and he does very good pretty good and very explanative illustrations so thanks and of course the deep learning community in general like we cannot have such an initiative if the community in general wasn't open and wasn't willing to share ideas so Thanks for that as well. So thank you everyone for attending this talk. I'm very sorry for all the small, all the interruptions in the middle. It's my first time. So hopefully the next time I give a topic, uh, give a talk on topics, uh, there won't be any interruptions like this. And uh, thanks a lot for spending more than an hour with me listening to my talk. And if you have any questions, or any follow-up ideas that you want to do whether you want to go ahead implementing chutney or if you want me to elaborate or have another talk on some particular topic feel free to reach reach out to me so thanks